Welcome to another episode of Fear the Old Lore, where we look at the English and Japanese versions of games for more insight into their lore. In my previous videos, I've explained how easy it is for technically accurate translations to still have details which get lost in translation. Because it's difficult to know what's relevant without context or specific direction, it can be a nightmare to translate something as cryptic as Dark Souls, because even the smallest details can have significance, or just end up being nothing at all. It isn't always possible to naturally convey information one-to-one -one between languages, especially if you're trying to keep the audience immersed in another setting, so there are times concessions to technical accuracy have to be made, which can be a kind of catch-22. If you translate something literally, it might sound completely unnatural or lackluster in the target language, but if it's altered to be more palatable, you may inadvertently remove the context of the original and lower the cohesion of the final product. While my last video about Jujutsu being translated as pyromancy was fairly straightforward, the topic of sin as it relates to Dark Souls is anything but. While it's important to note that Aldia wasn't originally in Dark Souls 2 upon its release, and was later included with Scholar of the First Sin, it's ironic that the game hardly focuses on sin at all, and has never even explained what the First Sin is. Instead, it's left open to interpretation, and so to satiate my own curiosity I decided to look at what exactly the First Sin is, and sin in general to better understand the lore. It's a surprisingly large topic, so bear with me if it seems like a bounce around subjects at times. The term First Sin comes from Genzai which when broken down literally is first, original, primary, or principal sin. First sin isn't a mistranslation by any means, but Genzai is also what's used for the concept of original sin found in many denominations of Christianity. Since Scholar of the First Sin is the title of the DLC, and thus directly linked to sales, I think it was a smart choice to avoid calling it Scholar of Original Sin, since it could have stirred up a lot of religious baggage or unwanted controversy over something unrelated to the game. Nonetheless, even if there could only be a trite and tragic ending, I still think it's worth exploring if Original Sin fits into the greater themes of the game, or if it sheds any light on what exactly Aldio was the scholar of. Opinions about the nature of Original Sin can vary, and it's not even recognized in Judaism and Greek Orthodox Christianity, so take the following with a grain of salt. It's most widely associated with Catholicism, and according to its catechisms, original sin stems from the belief that all humanity is burdened by the sin of Adam disobeying God and eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, since all men inhabit Adam in one body of man. Arguments can be made about the consequences of original sin, that it subjected man to death, an eternal struggle between doing good and evil, or replacing spiritual harmony with physical decay. All of these can be compared in some way to Dark Souls, with men losing their spiritual identity and turning hollow, or being forced to face death time and time again. Man's selfishness in placing himself above God can be compared to how Lucatil says she's willing to sacrifice anything at all to preserve herself, even if it means turning her sword on the player. Her propensity to sin and murder shows the ugly nature of what it takes to live, as we need to kill and eat to survive. Of course, these aren't the only ways to interpret how original sin may relate to Dark Souls, but hopefully it can serve as a platform for further exploration. With that being said, I don't think the way the first sin is presented in Dark Souls 2 is meant to be directly tied to the original sin of Christianity, though it may have been partly inspired by it. In some ways, this justifies the localizer's choice, as it's pretty clear they're separate, but I know some would still want that information in the game so they could come to their own conclusions. As usual, I'd like to be clear we're not given a direct answer as to what the first sin is, so the following is based on inference and speculation. The term First Sin only appears in the games once in the Forlorn set, so let's start examining things from there. Hood of the Forlorn, who wandered the land of the undead. Born of Aldia's obsession with the First Sin, the Forlorn lost both their corporeal form and a world to call their own. Now they drift into other worlds ever in search of a home. But without self, one has neither beginning nor end, and so the Forlorn have only to wander. This doesn't give us too much direct information on what exactly the First Sin is, other than Aldia being obsessed with it. Even so, we may be able to come to a better understanding of it by examining what else we know of him. Considering that Aldi is the scholar of the first sin, it would make sense for his research to be related to it. From what we know of him, Aldi was consumed with finding a way to overcome the undead curse and conducted blasphemous experiments that led to the creation of malformed creatures like the Mastodon Knights, Enhanced Undead, the Forlorn, and possibly even the Guardian Dragon and some of the other creatures appearing throughout his estate. The malformed shell may give the most revealing clue as to what he was researching. Life itself. Malformed Shell. One of the malformed weapons developed in Aldia. Swung like a great hammer. It appears to be a fragment of a giant shell, but its precise origins are unknown. The peculiar figure known as Lord Aldia attempted to uncover the secrets of life itself and viewed the undead as a key to this mystery. 
there's a few discrepancies with the text. It probably won't come as a surprise, but the shell wasn't necessarily created in Oldia, it was created by Oldia. Without context, this kind of mistake can happen surprisingly easily, because it may not have been clear to the translators whether Aldia was the name of a person or a geographic region. As a result, a number of items related to him have similar issues, though it should have been clear Aldia was a person, especially with the second paragraph referring to him as Lord Aldia. Thus, items like the malformed shell and sunset staff should be understood as having been created by Aldia and his followers, rather than in Aldia. The more relevant discrepancy with the malformed shell comes from its final paragraph. Rather than saying the undead are key in uncovering the secrets of life, the Japanese says Aldia sought the power to reveal the mystery of the undead. Semantically, these are close, but the emphasis of the sentence is reversed. So rather than the undead being key to uncovering the mysteries of life, it's that the mystery of life is the key to being undead, which better fits into Aldia and King Vendrick's attempts to overcome hollowing and the undead curse. From this, we can come to a few conclusions. Since Aldia, the scholar of the first sin, is studying the mystery of life, it's possible to interpret the first sin as being life itself. However, since his goal is to overcome hallowing and the undead curse, it could also be argued the first sin is either hallowing or the curse. Then again, with the curse forcibly reviving man over and over until they link the flame or go hollow, there may not be much differentiating them. If he was studying the undead curse, it would make sense why Aldia's keep contains a number of enemies affiliated with curses. The giant basilisk in a cage and the kobolds outside inflict curse, though the things betwixt counterparts do not, and the caged mimics are afflicted by the curse of the branded. Abhorrent curses eat away at the core of one's being, and a number of all these creations cohere to the way curses drain life and souls, with Unleash Magic draining HP, the Northern Ritual Band reducing max HP, and the Warlock Mask increasing in the number of souls obtained from enemies like the Curse of the Symbol of Avarice. In trying to overcome the curse, Aldia studied all manner of life ranging from men, giants, dragons, and even pygmies if we take the Kojin of the Homunculus Mace and Wooden Shield to be the same Kojin of the Furtive Pygmy and the Pygmy Lords of Dark Souls 3. He may have had some measure of success. The Dragon Acolyte Hood and Mask say they're designed to deflect the ire of their ritual sacrifices, with ire coming from how one can curse another with their dying breath. Additionally, the Forlorn Sight may suggest he did free some men from the Undead Curse, though it may not have had the result he intended. It's extremely vague in 2 alone, but the homeward spell in Dark Souls 1 and 3 mentioned the miracle would normally link to one's homeland, but the curse of the undead distorted its power, redirecting them to a bonfire, and perhaps for an undead, the bonfire serves as home. As we can see, bonfires serve as the metaphorical home of the undead, but Aldia's experiments have twisted the forlorn to be free from the curse. As a result, they're no longer linked to the bonfires and have no homes of their own so they wander the worlds of the undead in search of another. While we're not told exactly how they were created, the Forlorn Greatsword and Scythe reveal the Forlorn were born of Aldia's sinful infatuation. Unfortunately, some contextual information was lost in translation, and a more literal interpretation of the Japanese is closer to the Forlorn were one of the sins his passion produced. Rather than Aldia's infatuation being sinful, the Japanese specifies the existence of the Forlorn as a sin. While it's not exactly inaccurate, Infatuation comes from jonin, which essentially means an irresistibly strong emotion like love or hate. Infatuation captures the feel of it pretty well, but the real issue is jonin appears in more contexts which shed more light on this relationship. In Profound Still we have, This hex, born of jealousy and humiliation, is a locus of dark thoughts, the very things that reflect the true essence of life itself. The dark thoughts here come from kurai jonin, or dark emotions, and shows they're connected to life. This is reinforced in Affinity, which says it creates a dark mass that seems to pursue its target with a will of its own. It appears to be a manifestation of an emotion, perhaps of hate, perhaps of love. When taken together with spells like Homing Soul Mass and Soul Dregs, we can see that life in the form of souls in the dark is drawn towards itself, and it can be manifested through strong emotions. If Aldia's passion produced the Forlorn, and their existence is a sin, it shows an undeniable connection between emotions, sin, and life. Knowing this may help contextualize how the Chaos Flame was created, and why Isolith was reborn as the Lost Center in Dark Souls 2. It's a little convoluted, but according to Floating Chaos of Dark Souls 3, Chaos burns away in the blink of an eye, but was the primordial life born in the bed of Chaos, and a grievous symbol of Isolith's sin. Clumps of Chaos are shreds of life according to Seething Chaos, so if Chaos symbolizes Isolith's sin, it would mean that Isolith's sin is life itself though it's probably meant more in the sense of how the Chaos Flame transformed her into a twisted bed of it. 
It isn't conveyed in the English text, and even in Japanese it'd be natural to read it as a metaphor at first. But Chaos Storm in one says it was the Witch of Isolus' ambition which produced the Chaos Flame in her attempt to recreate the first flame. However, if Aldea's passion or infatuation was a sin that spawned the Forlorn, then it might be meant to be read more literally. Either way, it seems Isolith's sin was the result of her ambition. Aside from Isolith potentially being transformed as a result of her emotions, we also have the covetous demon who was transformed by his unrequited love for the queen, and Mytha may have also been transformed by her twisted love for the king. The gaping dragon suffered a similar fate, as was corrupted by life and transformed by emotion and desire according to game director Hidetaka Miyazaki. One cool facet of Mytha is that her soul says love is a spellbinding curse, though it may not be met literally. Nevertheless, it's extremely difficult to tell what's coincidence from what's chosen intentionally, especially in a game as cryptic as Dark Souls. Mytha's soul wouldn't be significant on its own, but when taken with what else we know about emotions and their ability to corrupt, it gives me more pause in glossing over it. This brings me to the topic of the Pursuer. Just like how Mytha's love is a spellbinding curse, the Pursuer is called Jubaksha in Japanese. Now this is a little hard to convey, but typically Jubaksha would be understood as something like Spellbinder, or more literally Cursebinding one. However, the name is ambiguous and can also be understood as Cursebound one. Since the Pursuer literally pursues those who have been branded with the curse throughout Jang Lake, the English name for it works pretty well, and it would most likely convey the former meaning in Japanese that it's the Cursebinder. Be that as it may, there's some small details in its items which makes me question whether it's meant to be read as Cursebinder and Cursebound one simultaneously. The soul of the pursuer says, The pursuer, who seeks the bear of the sign, will not rest until his target is slain. I really like this description as I think it does a great job characterizing the pursuer's mission. This isn't entirely relevant, but I think some would be interested in this, so the Japanese says, It was given orders to hunt those who possess the sign. Even now it continues its mission. It's possible it was the old Iron King who gave the pursuer its orders since the Iron King persecuted the undead, and the Pursuer drops a ring associated with Alkin, a kingdom he came to rule over. The Pursuer also appears in places affiliated with the Old Iron King, but it's not limited to those, and it's also possible Vendrick gave the Pursuer its orders instead. If the Pursuer must tirelessly hunt the undead, one could say it's cursed to fulfill a never-ending mission. Its equipment may also feed into this idea, saying, The Pursuer hunts down those branded by the curse, as if each undead soul that he claims will atone one of his sins. Just for quick reference, singular and plural isn't often distinguished in Japanese, so it's unclear if the pursuer has to atone for multiple sins or a specific one. Now, depending on how you want to interpret the role of the pursuer, it could be argued it's bound to a kind of curse that forces it to stay alive until all undead have been vanquished. If its sins are tied to its existence, then the only way it could rest and find peace would be killing all those branded by the undead curse. It's worth reiterating this is speculation based on dubious linguistic connections, but one question I'd have is why include information about the pursuer's sins at all if they're not relevant? This isn't to say they aren't relevant in a different way, but for me, I like the idea that the pursuer is as much a victim of circumstance as we are, and it would help give some motive to what may otherwise be a solitary serial killing stalker. It would also help explain how the pursuer can curse the player in its attempts to hunt down those branded by the curse, but I digress. If we believe Oswald and Cromwell, it is human to commit sin, and emotions like regret, anguish, disillusion, and bewilderment are the essence of life. If so, if it's part and parcel in how embodying love and hatred and affinity will cause it to pursue its target, and how isolated sin can be considered life in the form of chaos. And if we believe Saldan and Lucatil that life is the curse, we can potentially link sin indirectly to curses. Quite a lot of these interpretations rely on hearsay and circumstantial evidence, which I'm not the biggest fan of, but there are a few more pieces of information which may solidify these connections. In my previous video, I mentioned pyromancy comes from Jujutsu, which can be literally broken down as curse technique, though the term is used more broadly today. When looking into the lore of the games more deeply, I was surprised to learn pyromancy was derived from the Chaos Flame instead of Flame Sorceries. As usual, pyromancy's potential relation to curses remains inconclusive, but there is a flame that does have a direct tie to sin and curses. The Profane Flame. The Profane Flame, or the Flame of Sin, is said to have been spawned from the curse of the female relatives of the court sorcerers of the Profane Capital. One of the issues with that is despite still being written in the limited omniscient third-person perspective, the description is based on hearsay so it should be treated with skepticism. Nonetheless, I've wondered if the unfading nature of the Profane Flame is supposed to mirror the unfading curse of the Dark Sigil, 
and we don't have much reason to doubt the description as it is. It would be fitting if the flame of sin was spawned from a curse, and just like how the chaos flame was spawned from Isla's ambition, the profane flame is linked to ambition as well. According to the profane greatsword, when Sullivan was yet a young sorcerer, he discovered the profane capital in an unfading flame below a distant tundra of Irithyll, and a burning ambition took root within him. The fire witches of Irithyll also had their hearts swallowed by the profane flame, and that they mindlessly abandoned their old faith and served Pontiff Sullivan. One aspect of the Eleonora's description which confused me for a long time was how it said the monstrosities of sin went on living without any cares after the birth of the profane flame. Given what we know now of the flame of sin, and sin's connections to emotions, it makes me wonder if it was produced literally from the ambitions of these women, and now that it exists beyond them, they've been left without ambitions of their own, hence their carefree demeanor. I know since the profane flame is said to have been born from the sky, it might give the impression that it came down from the heavens or something like that. While it does use the character for sky, Sora can also be read as Ku in the sense of being empty. If I were to relocalize it with this in mind, I'd say something like it was born out of thin air since that phrase already exists in English, conveys the same message, and preserves some of the ambiguity of the original. Another difference I found is in the Jailer set, where it says, The Jailers are among the few survivors inhabiting the profane capital later serving under Pontiff Sullivan. Perhaps the screams emanating from the cells help them forget their old home. The final portion differs by saying, Perhaps the screams of the Jail appeased their homeland, with appeased being met in the kind of religious sense to soothe gods and spirits. There is a kind of theme with the profane flame of delighting and taking solace in the suffering of others that mirrors the nature of the dark and curses. The Eleonora's feast spell weapon art can allow one to regain HP from striking an enemy, the Handmaid's Dagger restores FP with each successful attack, and the Jailers can temporarily drain the player's max HP as though they were cursing them. It's also said the profane flame burnt naught but human flesh, suggesting that it might function similarly to spells like Affinity, Soul Dregs, and Homing Soul Mass. The most likely explanation for this is that the profane flame is alive to a degree, and if we're to believe Andre in that he sees the abyss in the profane coal, it more or less confirms it. The Ring Knight set says the arms of early men were forged with the abyss and betray a smidgen of life. If we take how life in the form of chaos represents Isola's sin, all of these disparate elements of the lore start fitting together more cohesively, and it shouldn't come as a surprise that the flame of sin would be related to life in some way. With all that being said, a part of me really doesn't begrudge the translators for choosing to go with calling it the profane flame. When compared to something like the chaos flame, it would sound a bit unnatural to call it the flame of sin, or sin flame, and the issues are only compounded in calling the profane capital the capital or city of sin. Since Sin City is a nickname for Las Vegas, it could have broken some players' immersion calling it the capital of sin, and the area could have felt cheaper and more gaudy as a result. Additionally, while part of me is reluctant to bring this up, Calling them both the Flame of Sin and the Capital of Sin could imply they're connected to Velka, the Goddess of Sin. Despite their names, I don't think they're meant to be directly connected to her, as there's not even a statue of Velka within the area, but ideally it would be up to the audience to decide for themselves, and with the way the games are currently written, there is no way to relate the Profaned Flame or the Profaned Capital to her, though in Japanese it really wouldn't be unreasonable to ask if the Goddess of Sin has a role within the creation of the Flame of Sin or the Capital of Sin. Many have wondered, including myself, how and why a statue of Elka is able to provide absolution and remove curses in Dark Souls 3, but with sin being related to life and curses, it may be well within her power to remove them. The rings of sacrifice are able to subvert death and prevent one from being cursed, and profound still which reflects the true essence of life itself originated from Velka's vow of silence, though it's possible it could have been recreated by someone else, kind of like how Gilia's hexes or straight spells should have been permanently lost. Either way, Velka being the goddess of sin and having some dominion over life and curses plays back into the way Isolith had to atone for the sin of creating life in the form of the chaos flame, and how the profane flame is tinged with life by being abyssal and born from a curse. The reason Aldia failed to shed the oak of fate is because he wanted to hang on to life and exist as a human beyond the undead curse. But with the nature of the curse being tied to life itself, the only way to be freed from it would be to die, or at least no longer be alive, which is why his research turned to the everlasting dragons. While they're animate, a true everlasting dragon perishes not and they're able to exist beyond the cycle of the fire. But to become one, one must abandon all earthly attachments and desires. Aldi and his warlocks created Shanalot, a child of dragons in an attempt to transcend causality and fate itself, but failed. The most likely reason for it is that Shanalot was more human than dragon and had desires of her own. The aged feather was supposed to convey her feelings, but it ended up being masked by localization. Rather than saying the child of the dragon sequestered away from the world, 
Imagine a world of boundless possibilities from the side of a mere feather. The Japanese says, The unknowable child of dragons, born shut away someplace, continued expressing her longing for freedom in a feather that floated in from somewhere. I was always confused by what it meant that Shanelot imagined a world of boundless possibilities, or why she even had the feather to begin with. But the Japanese clears up both of these. This is probably one of the rare cases I'd argue it's an example of localization gone too far, but even so, I can see what they were going for with what they ended up choosing. Sometimes this approach can work out well, and sometimes it doesn't. One example of it working well is when Shanelot tells the player about her origin and says, Fate would not be bested, and men were cursed once again. The Japanese for it just says, even now fate keeps spinning and man remains captive. So while she doesn't directly say the curse is responsible for imprisoning them in Japanese, it's all but understood, and the English does a nice job conveying that. I wouldn't have necessarily said they were cursed again, but that's really just splitting hairs at this point. Anyway, creating Shanelot was a failed attempt to overcome karma and fate because she's alive. Showing that she has desire and the longing for freedom proves it, and desire in general is what anchors men to the world and fuels their attraction to life, fire, and the dark. Although the terminology isn't always consistent even in Japanese, desire comes up time and time again in things like Great Fireball, Yearn, Fire Seeds, The Scythe of Want, Dark Pyromancy Flame, Chaos Rapier, Embers, Homeward Bones, Great Combustion, Fire Orb, Deep Soul, Homing Soul Mass, and Rapport among many other dialogues and descriptions. We don't have a clear answer of what separates sin from life, desire, and curses, but one theory I have is that desire is the kind of primary motivator for committing sin. While I could be wrong, it seems counterintuitive that just being alive is a sin, but sinning may be what it takes to survive. For example, one needs to eat in order to survive, but even something as innocuous as that requires killing something, even if it's just a plant. Of course, the undead don't need to eat anymore, but they do absorb souls from others, so even for them, the sin of killing is integral to survival. Not all sins need to be committed for the sake of survival, but at the very least, Nishandra, the literal avatar of wanton hunger, shows there's a relationship between desire, emotions, and the dark. Just like with Nishandra, the other children of the abyss embody emotions with Alana representing wrath, Nadalia loneliness, and Alsana fear. Despite being motivated by different emotions, they all have the same desire for souls, and their forms are said to hint at humanity's true nature. Indeed, the way Alsana fear disappearing and dying is reflected in the way Lucatil doesn't want to die, and the willingness to sacrifice others to preserve oneself may be integral to understanding sin. Life itself is suffering, so those who aren't able to let go of it will continue to suffer. Being unable to let go of one's life, self, or ego has been shown to lead to ruin multiple times over, with Seath, Logan, and Osiris going mad, Arena and High Lord Wolnir being swallowed by darkness, and even Aldia himself loses his body and transforms into a grotesque monster. Gwyn's fear of men ushering in an age of dark is what led him to subverting the natural order of the universe by linking the flame and artificially prolonging life. Thus, if Aldia truly wanted to be freed of the curse, he would need to become a dragon or embrace oblivion by welcoming in the dark. But it would take an unbreakable will to overcome the shackles of the gods and cast life away. Life is brilliant, beautiful. It enchants us for the point of obsession. Some are true to the purpose and they are shields, fresh in mind. One man lost his own body and but lingered on as a head. Others chase the charms of love. However, it is. What is it you? Placing one's life or self over the universe is akin to the blasphemy of the original sin of Adam and Eve. The reason Aldia will continue to await the answer to dispel the undead curse is because life is destined to pursue and perpetuate itself. And so, he'll seek the answer to life and the undead curse insatiably, just as Ash seeketh embers. At the beginning of the video, I mentioned how the smallest details can end up being significant or end up being nothing at all. While it may have been easier to digest some of this information now because I was able to present the parallels side by side, I can guarantee it's only because I had the luxury of being able to compare all three games to each other, making it much easier to build my case. The translators working on these games didn't initially have this luxury, 
and they were also inundated with superfluous information that would have made it harder to draw these conclusions. For instance, while I touched on it briefly, I really don't blame the translators for overlooking how important sin is, partly due to how casually it's used for Velka and PvP covenants. And with Aldia not fully added until Scholar of the First Sin was released, it's not surprising that it was downplayed in Dark Souls 2 either. Translating things literally isn't always the best option, as we can see with the First Sin and Original Sin, and sometimes localizing things can end up obscuring them with the profane flame and the flame of sin. Sometimes things will be lost no matter the choice a translator makes, and rather than placing blame onto others, I think it's more constructive and interesting trying to better understand the lore for myself and share what I find with others. Now for some closing thoughts. It's a little ironic that despite this video focusing on the topic of the first sin, we still don't have a clear picture of what it is. I know arguments can be made that it was Gwyn leaking the first flame and I'm fine with that, but I also think it's important to recognize ambiguity and allow people to come to their own interpretations. I'm a little annoyed that we don't have a better understanding of how sin relates to life and curses other than them being related to each other. It'd be nice to know where the boundaries between them lie, but what are you going to do? I couldn't really fit this into the rest of the video, and it's very heavy speculation anyway, but I've wondered if committing sins literally keeps people alive, and it's really interesting how the insolent armor set in 2 says the insolent's death were postponed for their sin of arrogance. Consequently, I've also wondered if death is what atones for sin, as the atonement miracle given to the exiled pilgrims of Londor attracts the attention of enemies, and the way Valka goddess of sin meets out punishment to sinners and wrongdoers is essentially just sending out cosmic hitmen to kill them. Of course, one death alone may not be able to atone for one's sins completely, as Izalith becomes a lost sinner in Dark Souls 2, and we can kill players and NPC invaders like Herc multiple times since they're undead and will revive at a bonfire. Even so, death is what ultimately frees one from the undead curse, so it makes sense for death to atone for sin, and it could even be compared to the way the death of Jesus atones for the original sin of mankind. But again, take that with a heavy grain of salt since it might not be meant to be related to the game. While I take pride in the connections I've made between emotions, sin, life, and curses, a part of me is frustrated at how much of it feels like a house of cards that's based on very specific interpretations of the text. Nevertheless, I feel like there are too many coincidences for these conclusions to be mere coincidence, and the evidence I've provided supports my claims. With that being said, there's still ample room for disagreement, and I don't want it to seem as though my interpretation of the lore is final. I hope you enjoyed watching this, and even if you disagree, I hope I've given you more food for thought. Please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing this video, and I intend to cover more Soulsborne content in the future. If you can't get enough lore and want to discuss more, also consider joining the Discord server in the channel description. To all my patrons, channel members, viewers, commenters, and subscribers, thank you for watching. I appreciate it. Your support makes it easier to continue working on these kinds of projects, and I look forward to producing more. Be sure to ring the beckoning bell for channel notifications, and remember, fear the old lore.